when you are ready. We are in the process of admitting people. We have 50 registered participants and we are 10 at the moment. So we are just working on admission and then we'll start um, once we are all here. So I think five minutes have, have proved to be so Zoom etiquette of waiting. We'll, we'll still continue to admit people, of course, but, but we'll also start and, and I will um, hand over to Jelena who will do the introduction. Yes, hi. Uh, welcome to our uh, lecture and workshop. Uh, my name is Jelena. I am very glad to be uh, representing today the open working group, I Know I Care. Um, it is a feminist collective that gathered around in 2019 um, for uh, the uh, Wien Festival. Um, then we did a project together, uh, an exhibition in one of the uh, former uh, laundry houses in Vienna and also published a small book this year. And now uh, we have another presentation in the uh, Association of Women Artists of uh, Austrian Association of uh, Women Artists in Vienna. Um, hopefully, we will open our show or manage to open it on the 8th of um, February now. And as a part of our additional program, we are very happy that um, in collaboration with Elke Krasny from the Academy of Fine Arts Vienna, we were able to host a lecture and a workshop. 
As you well, know, yeah. Mitic also um, already pointed out, this is a collaboration between the Open Working Group, I Know I Care, um, that has been continuously working for a longer period of time now, and um, the um, Program for Art and Education, which I'm head of at the Academy of Fine Arts Vienna. Uh, at, at the program, we are very interested in working on questions around feminism, caring, labor, and, and the arts, and therefore we were um, very happy when we were approached and invited to collaborate here um, to host together um, Shaka Homfrey and her lecture. And then we will have a workshop uh, which will be uh, facilitated by Shaka, Natalia Avlona, whom I will introduce before the workshop, Jelena and myself. And now I will hand back to Jelena who will introduce Shaka. We agree that we will be very short in order to give more space to uh, the lecture, Sharka Homfrey. Uh, is a lawyer, publicist, and researcher based in Prague. She's a feminist and trade unionist working in labor and public uh, service law, discrimination and inequality. Uh, Homfra is interested in the digitalization, flexible and precarious work, care and unpaid labor. So Sharka, please, we would like to hear your lecture. Uh, hello, good uh, afternoon stroke evening to uh, everybody. Um, I will now attempt to share my screen and uh, the lecture that I have prepared for you and hopefully it will work. Um, we have set aside approximately 30 minutes for the lecture and uh, that should be a sufficient time to go over uh, what I have prepared for you with some um, with some uh, possible time for questions as well. However, the biggest portion of the debate should take uh, place in the, in the uh, uh, subsequent workshop. So keep that in mind. And uh, if you want to ask anything straight to the lecture, then uh, go ahead. But if you, if you want to have more of a discussion, perhaps uh, wait for the workshops and then, the, then there'll be lots of, lots of uh, space for that. Um, the title of my workshop is ever so slightly, uh, I don't even dare to say provocative, but uh, may sound a bit strange to you, the right to overwork. And uh, the question that I posed myself and what uh, I would like to present to you is, is there anything actually preventing us from overworking? Uh, do we have any obligation or um, is there any reason why I think we actually have to take care of ourselves? Um, as I'm a lawyer, I will take it uh, a bit from the legal point of view. Uh, that's not only because of my uh, occupation as a lawyer, but because I strongly believe that law doesn't exist in a vacuum. It shapes everyday lives and should be treated as such. And uh, that's why in some of my work, I try to bring law um, to like from a different perspective and look at things from legal perspective that may not have been thought about before. Now, just very shortly introduce myself. This is a picture of me about five years ago before I was um, um, as overwork and tired as I am now every day with working several jobs and having two children and studying in a second university, proving me um, the importance of self-care time and uh, <laughs> uh, the prevention of burnout never being uh, too far uh, away. Uh, as been mentioned, I, I'm a lawyer and I specialize in labor or public service law. Uh, I do write uh, about stuff, I do hold lectures, I do participate on um, many different research projects. Uh, the topics I've been interested in lately are working on are as diverse as workplace bullying, precarious uh, micro businesses, and the problematic the problem of uh, gender pay gap. So anything that sort of concerns work and workplace is stuff I'm interested in, and I always try to look at it from different points of view and bring different perspectives together. Now, enough about the, the introduction. Let's get on with the um, with the lecture itself. 
um, it's, you, it's probably you, all of you know, or many of you know, uh, there are certain limits, legal limits to paid work. Uh, when you're employed, you have uh, labor law that uh, tells your employer what he can or can't do and demand of you. Uh, that hasn't always been the case. Uh, uh, all the labor law and the limits and the legal regulation of uh, work has uh, been, uh, was preceded by uh, hundreds of years of worker struggle to actually uh, get such. But for uh, just over a hundred years ago, since the since the foundation of internet uh, of international labor organization, we can consider that the basics of the modern principles of labor law were laid down. I will only briefly mention labor uh, European labor law, as that is the area all of us sort of uh, work within and the fact that it's philosophically founded on some common principles. And one of the principles, the one that I found most important, uh, is the principle that employees uh, have unequal bargaining power when compared to employers. And this inequality justifies the regulation beyond just the contract between the employee and the employer, and uh, statutory and positive social rights putting down straight into legislation. We have some sort of harmonized uh, uh, labor law that in the, case, in the area of what we're talking about can be uh, sort of um, presented or represented by the working time directive that ever since 2003 unifies some sort of minimal breaks that our European Union uh, workers should have. There's a guarantee of minimum paid leave of four weeks per year, some parental leave, there's a cap on maximum working hours, which should be 48 hours a week, um, paid, uh, paid, um, uh, paid uh, rest breaks within shifts when you have a lunch break and other breaks of this sort. Then you can, in the law, you can find out uh, further breaks between shifts and their minimal length regulation over time, when is it possible to, pay, to work over time, how much over time are you actually legally allowed to do, and, um, and so on uh, and so on. The law lays down many guarantees of the fact that you actually won't be, just by entering a contract, forced to work 24 hours a day and just for yourself with no rest, uh, work yourself with no rest to your death. There's always the practical question of uh, uh, law enforcement and the breach of uh, the regulation, but alas, having regulation there is uh, the first uh, principle and the step to actually then enforce anything. Um, before I ask the, the main question of the lecture, uh, is there any some sort of regulation of this sort in the area of self-care, what is uh, actually self-care? What do we understand as self-care? Unlike many other things, there is not some sort of legal definition. Uh, you know, you don't find in law what self-care means. Even though you find bits of self-care obligations in law, it doesn't tell you what self-care actually is. Uh, I would like to point out two different um, uh, different uh, uses or areas in which this term is used. One of them is in, in the area of medicine, when self-care is understood as taking responsibility for your own health without professional medical um, help. This is, for example, can be found in this way. It can be found in uh, a World Health Organization uh, documents that describe the situations in areas from Africa where professional help is not always readily available and how to work within the community so people who can rely on professional care being there are able to take care of themselves. What you might be more familiar of is the meaning of self-care that popular psychology understands it and that is uh, basically an uh, undefined um, set of uh, activities or strategies for counteracting all the stressors in your life. Self-care is taking care of yourself uh, when everything else is sort of, sort of coming at you from different areas. Uh, the common framing of self-care in you know, the, what we now understand as the, the general debate is 
that if you practice self-care, you can do more, produce more, deal with more of what you may be subjected to. If you just Google self-care or tips on self-care, you always find articles uh, that are um, under the heading of 12 tips for students to uh, on their uh, 12 tips of self care for students to prevent uh, uh, burnout. Uh, how to use self care to get better work results. Um, what uh, common tactics or self care tactics can help women get ahead with their work. You see, it's always sort of placed. In a, as an instrument. It's not a thing on its own. Self-care is nowadays sort of understood as a tool to optimize yourself, re-strengthen re yourself, reinforce yourself, and carry on with your life and resist the stress. Uh, one conundrum that is uh, sort of um, and then arising from this approach to self-care is that you actually need to find some time for self-care. You know, if you if you want to exercise, if you want to take bubble baths, if you going to want to go to massages, or even if you just want to go to a therapist, you need to actually find some time for that. And you're supposed to find that time to manage more responsibilities or even take on more responsibilities that demand your time. So they are all, you know, it's, by approaching it like this, self-care is another thing on your agenda that you somehow have to fit in the calendar so that you can go on with all the other things that you already have on your agenda. Um, is this healthy? That's one of the questions that we can discuss in the, in the, in the workshop. What is the point of doing self, uh, actually even thinking about self-care if all it does is help you to just give more of yourself out again. Now, um, just by reading the articles that I mentioned, you may get the idea that there is nothing else in going on in people's lives than either work or study time and their own free time. But we know that's not true. We know that it's not true because uh, even the time that is not spent at work is on most cases, uh, not freely in our hands. We uh, have children, we live with people, we take care of some other people, we are part of communities, and uh, all these other interactions with other people usually uh, present some um, demands uh, and requirements on your time, and you have some obligations towards them. As I mentioned in the presentation, you are legally obliged to take care of your children. Once you have children, you have some like legal responsibilities towards them. And it's not just the basic care. Once uh, your children start going to school, you are, for example, legally obliged to respect the school's uh, regulation and to cooperate with the teachers. If you don't follow this responsibility or this obligation, there could be consequences, you know, and obviously there are many things like that. So you're not only responsible to your children, but also on their behalf. Uh, sometimes there are legal obligations toward other persons. If you have a dependent, the person you take care of because they can, are not able to take care of themselves on their own, and you get some sort of social benefit or subsidy from uh, you know, state or other public financing, then you do have some specific set of legal obli obligations how to care about that person. Uh, besides these obvious legal obligations that go sort of straight from the regulation, there are some contractual obligations that you may have towards your partners. When you enter marriage, you enter a contract. You can enter a contract between you and your spouse. Uh, marriage in all countries, in all the legal systems, is heavily legally regulated. Most of the people who enter marriage don't know that, or they don't know the actual extent of the, of the legal uh, obligations and contractual obligations that they enter themselves into once they actually ma get married. Uh, one of my uh, close friends and co-workers uh, is a lawyer, and she specializes in family law and does a uh, lot of divorces and lots of divorce cases. And uh, you would be surprised what some people 
have no idea that they're, for example, supposed to share their income with their husbands or wives. That the, according to Czech law, once you're married, all the money you bring into the marriage is equally shared between the two, regardless of how much each respective person earns. On the other hand, some of the people have um, an extensive idea of what should actually be the obligations of their partners. They think that once they get married, they're obliged to all of their time, all the care and everything. And then in, in uh, some of the divorce cases, um, it's, it, it's sometimes you don't even, you can't even believe that this, this person would take somebody they actually married to court because they don't cook dinner often enough. But yet that has actually happened. So uh, oral relationships with other people, obviously they don't have only the legal dimension, but they do have legal dimension. Even when we don't think of it and realize it, there is always something that is uh, somehow forming some sort of mutual obligations or contracts. Um, what does that mean for the, uh, for the, for the uh, uh, question of self-care? Self -care? Um, is there anything like the labor code that is stopping the employer from forcing you to overwork yourself or work nonstop? Is there anything that is stopping us from, you know, overworking ourselves by fulfilling all the commitments, taking care of other people, by dealing, just dealing with life? Is there anything? And if, well, we may actually answer that there isn't, not as such. Could the law be actually stopping us from running ourselves to exhaustion and burnout? And should it? That's uh, one of the questions that we will be talking about later, but uh, I would like to just um, make again a few legal points. What happens if you have too many responsibilities or for some other reason you can't just uh, oblige to them as well as you should? What happens if you don't care, take proper care of your children? What happens if uh, you yourself get ill and can't help uh, or take care of the dependent pe person on you, the, the people that depend on you. Uh, there, as, I, as I mentioned briefly, there could be consequences. There could be consequences uh, that are not that dissimilar than if you, that have what happens where if you actually breach a contract with your customer as a businessman. You know, you, as I said, for example, if you don't cooperate with your uh, kid's school, there could be some legal consequences and with some especially private schools, the kid could be expelled. There is, uh, there is um, you know, some sort of responsibility of that sort. If you neglect your children, there are obviously legal consequences that could be uh, entered into force uh, and being enforced by the public authorities. If you get social benefit based on taking care of somebody else and you don't take care of them, then the social benefit may be taken away from you. Does that mean that you have to fulfill your obligation if it, even if it damages your health? That's a question that doesn't have a simple answer. You know, from the legal point of view, there's actually nothing stopping you from bring, taking on more and more responsibilities for bringing on more and more um, stress on yourself in this sort of manner. Uh, but you have to yourself understand your limits and knowing when you can't take anymore. Sometimes uh, the things happen that nobody could, uh, could expect. For example, uh, you take on some different responsibilities or go to work, when you have children go to work because you expect uh, that they'll be going to schools on, or some childcare or something. And then all of a sudden, a global pandemic of COVID-19 happens and the schools are closed for half a year. But you still have your work contract. You have your kids at home all of a sudden. You have your work contract. What are you going to do? In this case, at least as was the Czech, uh, Czech uh, case, you could get a legal excuse from your work obligations. But you don't really get a legal ex excuse from the obligation towards your children or other informal, uh, informally uh, dependent people on you. You know, you just have to do what you, what you have to do. 
Um, I mentioned two legal terms here, just very briefly, because we don't think of breach of contract and force majeure in um, connection with our private lives. Breach of contract is, as I mentioned, what happens if you if you uh, don't fulfill your obligations. It should be mentioned that both sides of the contract have uh, equal um, equal uh, obligation to minimize any future uh, damage or any risk of damage. So you have to cooperate with the other person and say, look, you know, this is going to happen. I can't do this. I can't do that. Let's think of something together. That would be the legal legal way how to do it in case you were in business. Cause majeure could be COVID-19. You really couldn't expect a few months ago that you just won't be able to send your kids to school, you know, and this is not something you brought on yourself. Again, this is something that would have some sort of value in the, in the world of business contracts. Does it apply in the world of informal care? Probably not so much. Um, Politically or even philosophically, it's not easy to imagine that there would be law preventing you from taking on too much care. Yeah. Sometimes there are little hints of it, but we don't have time to go into that many much deeply. But in general, that's not something we can imagine that the law would have. But what we can imagine very easily is what if we were guaranteed some help? What if there was actually a legally uh, binding system of where to turn to if stuff is just there's too much of uh, responsibility for us if we can't work uh, if and care and educate and cook and uh, help with the sick uh, people you know anymore um what sort of help could it be I just noted a few ideas that could um, could be put into practice, and some of them are, and some of them aren't, which I will mention. But uh, we don't usually think of them as such. Or sometimes we do, like childcare and beyond, is something that always pops into our head. When you think, what would help me to have less, some help, less responsibility, and more time for myself? And then, especially when you're a parent, you think childcare almost immediately. But there are other things that could be uh, taken into question from this point of view, such as affordable housing. By affordable, I'm not only, uh, I don't only mean cheap, but also reliable and decent, good quality with uh, long-term contracts, something you can rely on, big enough. Framework for decent house health. Well, um, if you want to, I don't know how it is in, in, in your country, wherever you're watching us, but in Czech Republic, if you want to have somebody to help you with uh, your housework, um, you can get to some sort of official, official um, private business agencies that would provide the help, but they're very expensive and there's not that way that many of them. Or you can go to the informal market and talk to somebody else, usually a woman, quite often somehow disadvantaged woman, either a migrant woman or a woman from a lower social economical um, level than you are and you may arrange some sort of help with them, which has its ethical um, questions and problems that not many of us want to actually go to. What if actually there was a system for affordable house help? That, uh, would that help or would that not help? Another idea, spas and retreats for people and carers. You know, if policemen are uh, actually provided um, spa treatment fairly regularly, why shouldn't people taking care of disabled children, of their, even if, if their children are their own, of their older relatives, of anybody, why shouldn't they be allowed to have actually some sort of guaranteed and uh, approachable and affordable um, regeneration treatment as such? And what is actually in, in, at work in many areas are some sort of financial, for example, tax incentives. You can, for example, get, uh, in some countries, you can get a tax break for volunteering. Yeah, or uh, just for having children, you save a bit usually on some taxis. So these are all different ideas that actually are at the moment not uh, sort of legally guaranteed across the whole 
EU member states. There is not uh, such a detailed and legally binding EU legal framework for all the member states to guarantee you these um, and other sorts of helps. Uh, yeah, sorry. Before I get to the end, uh, and before we break out for uh, the, the um, discussions, I would like to point out one more thing, and the fact that that can't be ignored. All this uh, extra non-paid work and all the care work is heavily, heavily gendered. Um, uh, in all countries, even uh, especially in all the European countries, but also elsewhere, but even in those who are very advanced in gender equality, such as Scandinavian countries, uh, the European Institute for Gender Equality in their Gender Equality Index shows that it's women, uh, the, uh, women that more often cook and clean um, and do things of this sort than men. And it's men that more often go attend to culture and sports events than women. Obviously, the difference is, you know, the, the disparity is different in all these countries. You know, sometimes it's closer, sometimes it's larger, but it's always there. It's always there. It's always the women that take care, more care of the household and of the children, of learning with the children. And it's always the men who actually have more time for sports and culture. That's something that I find um, specifically upsetting, especially when it's like in Czech Republic, when there is 60, about 64% of women cook and clean daily, while only 19% of men cook and clean daily. You know, when you have a disparity this large, it just can't keep you, you know, calm. Um, and that is what actually brings me to the last question. And the question uh, that will actually bring us over to what we're going to uh, thoroughly discuss in the workshops. Do we actually need some rights to self-care? Do we actually need some right to help? You know, you know there is, is there any ways, why, is there a reason why we should fight for it and should not just accept it as um, the way life is? Well, just if you want, before you answer the question, just imagine what would you yourself do if you had an extra hour every day just for yourself and you were not, not only you didn't have to, but you were not allowed for that time to take care of anybody else. And I think if you answer that yourself, you'll find a reason why is actually there any reason whatsoever to give the unpaid work and the care work and all the responsibilities to give them the value they have, the importance to ha they have, and to actually call them labor and to regulate them as such. Thank you, and now it's time for questions. Thank you, Shaka, for, for your lecture and, um, and introducing um, perspectives on care and in particular on self-care from, um, from um, a EU legal standpoint. So, so many of, of us are of course care experts when it comes to our everyday lives, but not so many of us are experts when it comes to the, the legal and also the legal philosophical um, considerations um, of self-care and how to search for those in, in legal terms. What we were thinking of doing with the rest of our time um, this afternoon is, is the following. So we were thinking that um, we will have a roughly 10 minutes break uh, where Natalia Ablona will assign us to different breakout rooms. So, so we ask you not to leave uh, the link, the Zoom link, but to take some time in between, move around, open the windows, do all those things that make it easier for, for us to, to have more digital time together. And I also would like to introduce um, Natalia who has um, so graciously offered to um, co-chair, co-facilitate the, the workshops with us. 
Um, so I should probably say in terms of organizing, Yelena was the one who knew of Shaka's work and, and brought her into this discussion and said, you know, this is this fantastic lawyer in Prague and we really have to hear her speak because she looks at care from a legal perspective where many of us in the art or cultural context look at questions of care from our everyday life experiences or from, from artistic uh, practices or activist perspectives. And Natalia and I met some time ago in Berlin at a conference dedicated to feminist hacking. And we immediately understood that there were many shared interests um, that have to do with um, social reproduction and, and dimensions around care and social reproduction theory. Natalia uh, Rosalia Avlona is a, a lawyer and a researcher. She's based in Athens. She's a research fellow at the Hellenic Foundation for European and Foreign Policy and research co-lead at Disco Co-op. Her expertise is on digital commons and also on gender issues. She's focusing on the intersection of decentralized technologies, commons-oriented initiatives, gender and law. She's a member of the management committee of cost action from sharing to caring still ongoing 2017 to 221. And then I really liked the last sentence of the short bio she shared with us and that was also part of the mail out. Um, she wrote most of my free and non free time and I really like the expression non free time is devoted to feminisms and commons oriented initiatives. She has co-founded the Techno-Feminist Hacking Network Restorative Infrastructures. So um, I also want to use the, the last uh, minute for the break to really welcome all the different people who have joined from many different places um, on the continent and also uh, from the UK. And uh, we do apologize, Yelena and I, that we had some technical mix-up um, having to do with uh, using a professional Zoom link, which is mine, and, um, and Yelena having set up the Eventbrite invitation connected to her private Zoom. And so we had some kind of juggling to do behind the scenes. And I really do apologize that this happened. If we will have future, um, I know I self-care workshops will, will prepare be better in technological terms. Um, so uh, for, for the next um, 10 minutes, um, go away from the screen, but don't leave um, the Zoom connections and Natalia will, um, will uh, distribute us in, in the four different uh, working groups um, and each one of them will be facilitated by one of us, one by Shaka, one by Natalia, one by Yelena and one by myself. Hello, hello. So we are back. Hi. <laughs> Is everyone back? Wow, what a discussion. So what they suggest is that um, each of us, we have uh, two minutes to somehow like reflect on the rounds uh, we had. And, uh, and then we have like an, an open discussion and an assembly um, on what we discussed before. Because it seems that we had a lot of discussions that need further elaboration and a quite interesting thing. So, Yelena, would you like to, to start with summarize? Summarize in two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I was taking notes and it's a bit hard for me to kind of summarize in such a short uh, time. But we were discussing the difference between the people who are officially employed and the freelancers and how um, this differs in a sense. Um, we also said that um, some people actually from the group had opinion that um, actually the, the, let's say, preference to self-care um, has to do with some personal psychology and uh, with emotional predispositions and with states, actually. Um, we also um, were discussing about how the, um, it's not, so self-care, it's not only about uh, having time, it's about um, 
being in the emotional state where you are able or and willing to perform this action. Then there were uh, thoughts about that um, the, the kind of self-care could only be actually pre performed and uh, realized in, re in uh, connection with others. So as a, some act of several people or act of like a, a common act. So self-care is a common act. Um, yes, let me see. Um, yes, so, so there was like a um, question of uh, um, who is willing to make a, what available to the others. Then there were questions about um, doing everything for the greater good. Then we were like also discussing who are the groups that are most in need and how, how, who determines who is like in, in need and how to start actually taking care of others. That's like somehow second part. Um, when we are not familiar with the needs or for example, that like, um, I don't know, that the needs of 90% of people um, actually somehow um, neutralize the needs of 5% of people. And one of the X, concrete X that we mentioned is um, cooking for others as a, so how would you spend your time uh, for, um, how would you kind of um, give away your time? And the act that was mentioned was cooking and definitely like, uh, and somehow cooking was connected with banal things <laughs> in a sense. Yeah, so this is a short sum up. I'm sure that I missed something, but um, if people from the group have something to add, please do. Uh, Elke, would you like now to uh, go ahead? So I have two minutes for both of the workshops, right? Yes. Okay. So I'll start with self-care. So we were talking about some of the things to be expected. So take care of the body, do yoga, do exercises, sports, go outside, feel the sun, feel the air, be, be outside to breathe with the weather. Um, but we also understood that maybe it's not so easy to immediately know um, what self-care would actually be. Um, so, so we left that, we didn't really discuss that much, but it was, I think, a really interesting question. We talked about resting, uh, we talked about um, the superpower to wish for that we can be carefree for 60 minutes, that we don't worry, and that we can switch off our, our brain. Uh, we talked about doing something that is definitely not useful, that doesn't have a purpose, um, we talked about eating ice cream, having wonderful meals, and we also talked about nightlife, but that would need more than 60 minutes, and how much we actually miss nightlife. And we also talked about informal chatting, so, so how this, that you meet someone by chance and actually just have a conversation which you might also not be able to plan for, but actually have time for that can do a lot for self-care, but it wouldn't so much be a, a planned for activity. And then for the second question, if we had 60 minutes to actually purposefully do something with and for others, um, that was being described uh, that this activity would entail connecting people for whom it, uh, we think it is useful that they get to know each other. And that is also a form of community management as it would, was being described, investing time. And then there was a lot of investing time in already existing um, institutions. Um, or caregiving activities, like um, contributing to a food uh, cooperation, uh, uh, contributing to the, um, the cause that was set up by Selma Selman for um, Roma girls in Bosnia, um, get the heck back to school, uh, a foundation she set up, uh, activities connected to collective childcare, um, then it was being uh, mentioned that um, time would be dedicated um, to when someone is in um, 
what's the English word for Maßnahmen Vollzug? So, so in, in, the, in the jail, um, is that correct? Is that what you meant, Leah? Uh, yeah, it was, uh, it's really hard because it's a topic by itself and I only got to it through a podcast, but it's where people that are said to be um, uh, mentally ab abnorm and then they go to jail, to a specific jail. So it's not really jail. It is a jail, but it's not meant to be a jail. <laughs> that's the problem. So people, they are really suffering. And yeah, it would, that's, that was the cause because there's a, a, an association and there you can go and just meet these people and be, be just a person to talk to for them. Yeah. Do you mean a geschlossen Anstalt? Or do you actually... Maßnahmen Vollzug. It's kind of weird in Austria because you can get institutionalized into jail um, and uh, like, but then you need a diagnosis from a doctor that you are not insane. So people can get into jail and be labeled insane and then never get out for life. Wow. That's Maßnahmen Vollzug. Okay, thank you. Leah said she would devote her time so that she could be like a window to the outside for people who are in there. And then we also talked about uh, giving more time to, to elderly parents. Um, and uh, we talked about uh, giving time to setting up a movement around um, care or working politically with care. Great. Uh, that's great. Let's go to Sarka. Um, thank you. Uh, we agreed with uh, Michelle from our group that she'll make a start and then I'll, um, you know, add anything if that's necessary. So I'll ask Michelle to, to talk now. Yeah, so I'll start with the, the first uh, number of answers to the first question um, uh, on the topic of care, um, of self-care. Um, and uh, the first uh, position is to, to spend an hour to not do anything. Um, and of course, uh, we, um, in the, the, we did sort of cover these areas that Elke was uh, addressing. And hello, Elke, the chat is turned off, so I'm saying hello back. Um, yes, and so taking walks, uh, regular meals, uh, getting enough sleep, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but um, the conversation really went into this direction about some of this idea of neoliberal self-care as a regulatory instrument. And so that if you're taking an hour off um, to rejuvenate and to replenish, it's to sort of build up the reserves so you can get to that paperwork or you can sort of get to the next task. And so there is this element of sort of uh, resilience and prepare, preparation for more work um, in, within that space of the pause and this whole sort of future narrative related to a goal-oriented task, right? So self-care as a goal, as a task-oriented process. Um, and um, this sort of internalized capitalism that even if one is pausing, one feels guilty for pausing, for not working. So um, there was also this uh, discussion about sort of these uh, emergence of vitality coaches um, within sort of ac academies and this concern for mental health. Um, at the same time, this, this um, unwillingness to stop the machine of the institution. Um, so uh, there are these kind of moments where uh, one can have sort of individual counseling, but that's again to keep sort of the machine going. Um, so when um, we were asked about sort of imagine a vision care, uh, what would be um, uh, a vision of a care uh, network for the future, uh, moving to the from self care to self uh, to care of others. Um, uh, it was uh, there's some activities included um, a volunteer work um, such as uh, walking dogs. Um, there was also um, uh, 
um, making sort of an excursion uh, activities with and for um, elderly people, um, uh, uh, developing a theater group um, uh, um, in, uh, for, um, for people uh, and for other people. But um, uh, we also talked about sort of um, even just sort of small uh, things for building communities, such as meeting once a week, gardening, singing in the choir. So it's not necessarily what the activity is per se, um, but that um, there is sort of like this um, uh, regular sort of uh, meeting time of taking time for community building. Um, there's also uh, entering into even sort of getting involved in local politics. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's where I stopped with my notes. If Shark well, that's great, yeah, thank you. I would just add two things. Uh, what we found out uh, in the first round is that even people who don't care, have care obligations, who don't, they don't have children, they don't care about elder parents, you know, they're just either on their own or with their partners. They still have that sort of internalized feeling when they rest you know, that they shouldn't be really resting, you know, that it's not necessarily about the actual obligations you have or about the actual care, but it's just that this feeling that you should be doing this, you should be doing that. And then, you know, like um, that was a prevalent feeling. And one last thing that we sort of came to in the first round, but it applies to the second question as well. It's really not about the particular activity even if you do find time for regular exercise and reading enough books and everything, that doesn't guarantee that your mind will take rest. You know, so if you get all these self-help articles about what you should actually be doing, you know, what you should be putting into your schedules to take a break from the rest of your schedules, it, even if you do actually do it, that doesn't necessarily mean you're actually taking self-care. So that's where we sort of go to as well. That's great, Sarka and Michelle, thank you. So I will try to make it short, uh, what we discuss. And with, uh, please, like the rest of the group, please just join and add things from what we discussed, because I try to make a summary, but it, it may not be exhaustive. So um, yeah, in the first question, uh, what if we had uh, one hour uh, in, uh, uh, we, we all confronted some doubt of um, what does it, what self-care mean? And we think that we, we were feeling really strange to define it. And uh, we realized that um, uh, it's very different. The notion of self-care as something that is um, uh, applied to us, like from uh, advertisements and uh, from all this information uh, in the media uh, in terms of like self-punishment, for example, one hour of like uh, uh, joking, that is something that we feel obliged to do for our health. Uh, versus what is like a need that we can define as a very personal need that we want to meet in our lives and how we apply our self-care towards this need. So we realize that there is a distinction between two uh, the, towards these concepts as separate distinct concepts. So most of us would like to have like a, one hour to take a walk, not a joking, not jeans, no fitness. <laughs> To walk and uh, and and relax, and uh, this hour would be great if it was with no kids obligation or no thinking about the kid obligation, uh, which is not always the case. Um, another point was that um, if if this hour could be given to us to do everything that we are doing in the rest of the hours, but in a very slower pace um then another interesting thing is like the overlap of our uh social time with our work time and our uh, time devoted to community that they seem to overlap within a very uh the very same special restrictions of the same room the same house and um this made it very difficult uh for us in the group to define what this hour would look like if it's in if it's restricted in the same space that all the other obligations are conducted. So, um, and also uh, self, uh, self soothing uh, is um, a definition of a self, self care and in a, in a, in a way that um, addresses 
health issues when we have like health issues and we had health issues during COVID, then what does self-care mean apart from talking with doctors or doing what we have to do? How do we treat ourselves? So going to the second question, um, we kind of came to a common denominator that uh, all of us felt that uh, we have a lot of uh, care as a um, uh, intention and desire to give into community and to political actions but um, it seems that our need doesn't match the availability of the political organizations or communities out there so for ex one example is the need for um, working outside the house in a co-working space that could provide some services for childcare while you go there and you could also uh, give your time into helping set up this space, but also this space to provide services. This is one uh, thought that was explicitly uh, expressed in our group. And uh, summarizing all this, we came to the conclusion that um, we may have the need to offer to the community, but uh, the communities, as it is articulated in terms of like political organization or a neighborhood organization or um, a cooperative, uh, is not really prepared to absorb our uh, care work in a way that is meaningful or in a way that it can also be uh, useful for this organization. So we were thinking that like the restructuring of these uh, organizations in terms of accepting and absorbing our care work is uh, another issue that we are, uh, we would like to share and, and um, address. And we have one more political comment that Saskia would like to address, but I think uh, I'm done now. So we may open the room for reflection and further comments. So please uh, go ahead. Any further comments or ideas that were not uh, expressed by any of us? One question I have is, I have two questions to, to all of us. The first one is like, if you were a legislator, then what would you change in this pandemic politics? Something that affects you? So what would this be? I would definitely change, would definitely not only change. connected to this uh, current situation, I would definitely change uh, the different laws that apply to different types of employment. Um, why would there be work? So, in Austria, Angestelt, like an employed person, then there is a worker, then there is a freelancer. Like for me, this is too complicated. And every single type of um, employment is regulated by different law. So, um, and then uh, the like uh, self employed people, like they have like somehow the most precarious situation, which isn't actually having to do anything with more or less with the state regulations. So I would wish that we all have the same type of employment, for example, and that we are seen under the same law, which would mean that we have different rights. I mean, maybe, of course, this division was done because of the specifics of the work. But anyway, I think that COVID times actually give us a, a moment of overlapping. Most of the home office is something that freelancers were doing all the time. So there is a moment and need to kind of make some things equal in also in the sense of the law. It seems that the, it seems that the, the legislation that is uh, enforced like as pandem pandemic politics is actually exacerbating the existing like gendered inequalities in terms of, uh, of uh, work, but also like in terms of, of discrimination. So the people who were like paid like um, uh, very badly for their services or the care workers are still paid badly. 
and there are, but now like we have the lens of COVID and this is more visible and uh, and also like what happens with um, the remote working and the, the, the domestic violence and uh, and also like the online online violence there is there is a, there was a report that they found that women of the UN Commission that women were 24 more uh, times more likely to be abused online now that we all work online so uh, yes and another issue we discussed uh, with Saskia and our group is what happens that when like our private sphere that in regular times was highly unregulated and untouched by the legislator now is overlapped with our public life. What does this mean? I think that Elke wanted to say something. Um, I just wanted to say that actually we only have one more minute left um, and and I think many many of us um, are really um, can't be generous with their time precisely of all the things that we talked about that there are family needs uh, children uh, work obligations um, or other things to do and and so we were just wondering since um, we also understood this getting together today as, as a moment in time to, to look precisely at the questions that we started discussing and also the ones that Natalia raised now at the very end that of course we are aware of but, but often don't have enough spaces to meet and, and discuss and, and move them forward politically. So we were also wondering if, if you would be interested um, like those who signed up today um, and are still here in the workshop, um, if if we continued these, um, let's say, call legal, philosophical, and practical dimensions of it, if you would like to be informed, um, and if you are also interested in maybe slowly building up something that that can actually move um, since we already have two lawyers on board in a direction that that also becomes very concrete, if you will. Um, and and that's what we actually wanted to put out there at, at the end. So that we don't we don't see this as a one off. Um, but but being invited to the already existing I know I care group, we, we thought there's an opportunity of of yeah making this something that is um, part of a long term conversation with a lot of the people who are here today, having been involved with questions around care for a long time um, already, and 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 knowing very very much about it. So I guess that's that's what we really wanted to put out there at the end. And maybe um, for for those of you uh, for whom that is all right, you can uh, write to either Yelena or or me uh, that you would be interested in in being included in in future um, activities and and information. And I guess the last thing I want to do is thank everyone who came. So um, thank uh, Shaka for a really inspiring and, and very precise and clear lecture and Natalia uh, for, for sharing all the technical stuff with um, making us um, breaking out in groups and, and also um, working um, be pre preparing together with us. And then I want to thank um, Yelena and Mirjana who reached out to, to collaborate. And I want to say thanks, thank you to all of you. I mean, it's like Friday evening. So the typical time when people actually, um, I don't know, in the past said, thank God it's Friday. Uh, and so here we are um, thinking, working around uh, political and legal and philosophical notions around care. So I really want to say thank you.